just want to turn to uh, Joshua in chapter 22, Joshua chapter 22, and we just want to go down through the whole chapter, so rather than reading it all in a winner, uh, we'll just do it in sections, and um, we've got a, a heading, a, a title for each of the sections, I uh, can't quite remember how many there is, but uh, it's quite extensive, and we hope to manage to get through at least a a fair portion of it this afternoon. Uh, I really thought for a title for the chapter was Don't Jump to Conclusions. Don't Jump to Conclusions. Uh, because that's what the children of Israel were in danger of doing in this chapter. Uh, we noticed that they, they heard the story of something that happened was happening in the other side of Jordan and they immediately, they immediately put two and two together and instead of making four, they made three or five or six or something else. And they jumped to a conclusion, which if they had acted on it the way they were intending to act on it, then it would really have led to absolute disaster. And, and that's really, I suppose, the big lesson that we, that we need to learn uh, from this chapter this afternoon, the danger of jumping to conclusions. And so often we hear about things happening in, 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 in people's lives or in certain, just whatever, and, and we jump to a conclusion and we act on that. And sometimes by making two plus two and rather getting four, we get five as well and we make a disaster out of the situation. And so we want to see the, uh, the, the, the situation as it, as it unfolds in this chapter. In the first four verses, we've really got the, the commendation of the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh. Verse 1 says, then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And he said unto them, you have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. And you have obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. You have not left your brother on these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest unto your brethren as he promised them. Now, therefore, return ye and get ye unto your tents, unto the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. I suppose this was really uh, Reuben's, Reuben, Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh. I suppose this was really the demobilization day. Uh, this was demob day uh, for these tribes. You know, we've heard so much in the last week about mobilization and how that Vladimir Putin has, has uh, put into law this mobilization of reputedly 300,000 troops uh, in order to be sent to Ukraine. Mobilization to fight in the war. But this is demobilization. The war has now finished. And these men who are involved in the, in the, in the battles they're now being sent back home. It's demob day for the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh. But you know, it's interesting how the, that Moses commends them. You, you know, of course, one of the, uh, one of the um, restrictions that were placed on them when they requested of Moses that they stay on the wilderness side of Jordan it was that they must go over, the fighting men must go over and help their brethren to conquer the land of Canaan. And after their brethren had rest, after the battles had been fought and the victories won, then they were free to return back to the land that, that Moses had given on the other side of Jordan. And so Moses, uh, Joshua commends these tribes. He commends them for their obedience. You have kept all that Moses commanded you. You have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. And he says, you have not left your brethren these many days. You have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord. These were men that stood up to the plate. These men, these were men that were there fighting the battles alongside their brethren. They didn't abandon them. They didn't say, well, you know, we've got our inheritance on the other side of Jordan and we've got all our cattle to look after and we've got our families and we've got our servants and, and you know, we're just going to sail down here and, and the rest of you can go over Jordan and, and just fend for yourself. 
But you know, we noticed that there was that these two and a half tribes that were there standing side by side, shoulder by shoulder, with the rest of the nation of Israel as they as they entered into conflict and ultimately into conquest in, in the land of Canaan. They were there when they were needed unselfishly. They stood by their brethren. Brothers and sisters, that's a challenge to our hearts. You know, it's easy, isn't it, in life just to settle down, just to settle down. And just to think, well, you know what, I'm okay and, 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 and we'll just enjoy what we have. And yet the, the important thing is to stand, stand side by side with our brethren. Not to allow to see our brethren toil and struggle alone, but to be there by their side, fighting with them, shoulder to shoulder, realizing we're all part of the same spiritual conflict. And so in the first four verses, we've got the commendation of the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of, the, of Manasseh. Demobilization day. And they're going back. They're going back with a commendation. The commendation of their general. They had been obedient. They had been obedient to the commands. You know, it's good, isn't it, when, when we read about individuals and they get commendations uh, from the, the leaders in the battle. We, we hear about the, the, the George Cross and the and the, 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 the victory cross and, and all, these, all these medals, these commendations that people get because they've been faithful in the battlefield. They've been courageous in the battle. I wonder, you know, when we reach the end of life, I wonder will there be a commendation for us? Will there be a commendation for me? You know, we so often think of that uh, expression and it's quoted so many times at people's funerals. That they reach the end and they hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of your rest. I wonder if that will be true. I wonder if that will be true. I wonder if that will be true of me. I wonder if that will be true of you. That at the end of the day, the Lord can say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been obedient. You've been submitted You've carried out the orders. You've got yourself involved in the conflict. You haven't left, you haven't abandoned your brothers in their time of need, but you were there. You stood up to the plate. You took on the armor and you went and fought to the very end. Brothers and sisters, it's, it would be great just to get to the end and just to hear that commendation. And just to get that, that, these rewards at the judgment seat, that we can just lay at his feet in adoration and praise to him. I notice in verse 5, we've got the repetition of the charge that Moses had given the people. It says that, uh, verse 5, verse five uh, he says, take diligence. So he's sending them back over Jordan. He says, but take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law of which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments and to cleave to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's really a repetition of what Moses told the people prior to Moses' exodus, prior to that moment when, when the Lord put him to sleep, as it were, and he was buried, no one knows where, and he was taken home to heaven. But prior to going there, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6. We just flip back there. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. In verse number 7, it says, and you shall, this is Moses speaking to the people, you shall teach them diligently. That is, you teach them the, 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 the words of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord. Verse 5 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them for a sign upon your, upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes 
and you shall write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. And it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and goodly cities which you built not, and houses full of all good things which you fill not, and wells digged which you dig not, and vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you shall have eaten and be full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And then so he goes on and he's, he, he, he reminds them to, to fear the Lord and to serve him, to swear, to bow by his name and not to go after other gods, the gods of the people which are round about. Because it reminds him in verse 15, the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord God be kindled against you and destroy you from off the face of the earth. Verse 20 says, and when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what do these testimonies, what do these statutes, what do these judgments mean? Which the Lord your God commanded you. And it says in verse 21, thou, then thou shalt say unto thy son, we were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And so what Moses, what Joshua is doing in chapter 22 of Joshua is reiterating, he's repeating basically what Moses already commanded the people to do. And you know, it's good just to have things repeated in our mind. And, and, and Moses is telling the people, you need to keep repeating these things. You know, you need to have them uh, as frontless before your eyes. You need to have them in your hand. You need to have them in the doorposts of your house. You need to consider them when you wake up. You need to consider them when you sit down. You need to consider them before you go to sleep. These are the principles that should mark you. The things that distinguish you as the people of God. And we need to constantly be reminded of these things that Joshua is going to remind these two and a half tribes of in Joshua 22. We need to be reminded. You know, Orthodox Jews, they, they still have the little book of the law on, on their forehead and, and they, they have them wrapped around their hands when they go to pray. And they have a little tablet on the side of their door that they touch every time they enter their home and every time they leave their home because they want to be reminded that they're God's people under God's law doing God's commandments. Brothers and sisters, I know we're not under law in that sense, but we need to be reminded of our responsibilities. What are our responsibilities? Well, we need that they were to love their God. That's what he says in the middle of verse 5, to love the Lord your God, to love him. We're commanded to love him. We're commanded to love God with all our heart with all our soul and with all our mind. And Callum reminded us this afternoon about our priorities. What are our priorities in life? Is God at the top of the list? Do we love him? As believers, we're commanded. But not only is there a commandment to love God, I tell you there's a cause for us to love God. It's not just the obedience to a command. There's something kind of hard and dictatorial about that. But you know, there's a cause for his love. Not just a commandment, but a cause. Isn't that? We were thinking about it this morning. The one that gave his all on the cross, sent his beloved son. We thought, we thought about the sacrifice of the father, giving his only son placing him on the altar at the Calvary for us. I know it's in a different context, but there's that little expression, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause for us to love God with all our heart? And we think of so much that he's done for us. And the reason we read down through uh, due to these verses in Deuteronomy is that they were to remind their children and their children's children what they, what they were and how God and his grace had delivered them from Egypt. Maybe sometimes we just forget about that. 
Forget about what we were and where we were and where we would have been and what we would have been. But for God's intervention, but for his redemption, the redeeming power of the blood of the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, as we ponder that, what God has done for us, and there's every cause for us to willingly love him with all our heart and soul and mind. He's worthy, worthy, worthy of our love. You know, one of the things that we thought about or were bombarded with uh, last weekend was, you know, this outpouring of affection for the Queen. People loving someone that they've never seen in their life. Never spoke to. Never touched. Never received a letter. And yet here's a whole nation pouring out their affection for someone that they've never seen. You know, some people say, how can you love somebody you've never seen? Well, we've just proved it. People weeping as they stood in queues. People weeping as they pass as they pass through Westminster Hall. People weeping as the coffin went through the streets and villages and towns of our, and cities of our nation. People expressing affection for someone that they never see. Brothers and sisters, we we have had a letter from God. God has given us this book, which is God's love letter to man. God has revealed himself to us, and God has made it possible through the Lord Jesus for us to know him and to have that personal relationship with him. So if the nation can pour out their affection for the queen, then surely the church should be pouring out her affection for, for, uh, for, 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 for God and for his son, to love him, to love him. You know, it's interesting what, what Moses says, or Joshua says, he says, to love the Lord, your God, your God. It's a personal God. He's the God that redeemed them. He's the God that provided for them. He's the God that preserved them. He's the God that took them through the Red Sea and the Jordan and into the land and fought their battles and brought them into victory. It was all God that did it. The nation, but for the intervention of God, the nation would still have been in Egypt. Would still have been under the taskmaster's whip. But for the intervention of God. Brothers and sisters, where would we have been? We would still have been in Egypt. We would still have been under the bondage of sin. We would have been heading for hell, but for the intervention of God. Our God. Personal God that saw us ruined in the fall and loved us, notwithstanding all, and gave his best, gave heaven's best, that we might be redeemed, oh, that we might be lovers, lovers of God. And then he says, walk in all his ways, walk in all his ways. You know, it's this, it's this all-inclusiveness, walking in all the ways of the Lord. The will of God. Just seeking to know the will of God for our lives as he's, as he's unfolded in Holy Scripture. You know, some people kind of fret and fuss over the will of God and what's the will of God. And I know it's difficult in certain kind of practical situations when we need to make choices. What's the will of God? But you know, the big, the big, the big will of God is quite simple. It's our sanctification. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. It's living separated lives, living holy lives, living lives that are devoted to him, living as his possession. Lives of surrender to him. And that's what's demanded of us. That's the call of Christianity. It's just to be surrendered to God, to walk in his ways, to do his will, to please him. To be consistent in that. Walk in all his ways. There's a consistency. Brothers and sisters, there should be a consistency in our lives as believers. 
not just fits and starts, not just, not just walking to please the Lord when it pleases us and when things are good, but just walking to please him, walking in all these ways, even when it's hard and it's difficult and it brings persecution and it brings pain and it brings rejection. But we're not here to please ourselves and we're not even here to please others. We're here to please him. And he wants us to walk in all his ways. And then he says, keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. Beaches. Beaches. You know, there's nothing really delights a parent's heart more than just to see children being a beaching. Just doing what they're told. And yet it's, it seems to be the hardest thing for our kids to do. You know, a, a, a home where all the children are a beaching and submissive to their parents is a, is a harmonious home. It's a peaceful home. It's a blessed home they live in. There's nothing worse than when there's discord and there's friction and there's the spirit of rebellion because it just brings disharmony, it brings division, it brings hurt and pain and it makes life difficult for everybody involved. God wants his children just to be a beating. <laughs> Just to do what he tells us to do, just to just to carry out his commands and their, their multitude. And just just to just to be just to be surrendered. And just be willing, as we mentioned, just to just to please him in all things. And then he says, cleave to him, hold fast to him, live in absolute dependence on him, live in intimacy with him. Holding fast to God. You know, that you read through the Psalms and we just think of that relationship that David had of the psalmist. There's obviously more than one psalmist. Uh, but the, the relationship that they had with God, this personal God that they trusted in, they just depended on. When things were, things were tough, things were tough. You know, there's times when the psalmist is in the very pits of despair when he hardly knows where to turn to and his fear are well nigh slipped and then he comes into the presence of the Lord and in his presence he sees a different perspective and he clings to the Lord and his hope is in the Lord his trust, his confidence is in the Lord no oh, brothers and sisters that we might be like that in our lives just cleaving to the Lord when, when it seems, humanly speaking, that there's no hope. When everything's falling apart round about us, when there's problems in our home and there's problems in, 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 in a wider family circle and there's, there's problems at our work and there's problems in the church and there's problems everywhere we look. And sometimes these problems are overwhelming, overwhelming. You know, I was speaking to someone just the other day there and the problems that they're facing right now in life is, is just unthinkable. The pressure we're under and the distress and the pain and the hurt and the rejection. And even in circumstances like that, just to say, I'm holding on to God. I'm holding on to God. I don't see any way through. I can't see any better, man. I've got nothing to add to the situation. I feel so helpless and weak and broken. I'm holding on to you. I'm holding on to God. And yet that's a blessed place to be, isn't it? A place of rest. A place where our confidence is all living a life of dependence in him because he's the dependent one. Who else can we depend on? Can't even depend on ourselves. Our own heart is deceived. But you know, we can depend on God and we can rest our all. 
And then he says, serve him. Serve him with all your heart. Serve him with all your soul. Not only consistency, not only intimacy, but there's persistency. Serving him with all your heart and with all your soul. Giving your all to him. Brothers and sisters, we need to give our all to Christianity. Give our all to Christ. You know, I think Callum mentioned that this afternoon in the family service. You know, there, there's no room for half-hearted Christianity. Half-hearted Christianity was never the intention of God. You know, being ha- having a foot in two camps. Serving him when it, when, it, when, it, when it pleases us. And serving him the way we want to serve him. But just to serve him with all our heart and with all our soul. Just putting everything in there. Just putting everything in there. Because he's worthy of that. Absolutely worthy of that. And so in verses 1 to 4, we'll get the commendation and Verses 5, we'll get the repetition of these charges, these commands that Moses had given them previously uh, before he passed away. Verses 69, we've got the benediction of Joshua. It says, so Joshua blessed them, and he sent them away, and they went unto their tents. Now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan, but on the other half thereof, Joshua among their brethren on this side, uh, Jordan, westward. And when Joshua sent them away unto their tents, he blessed them. And he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents, and with very much cattle, with silver and with gold and with brass and with iron, and with very much raiment, divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go into the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, whereof they were possessed, according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. He blessed them. He blessed them. You know, that blessing was a result of the victory. You were really thinking about that this morning, weren't you? That, that all our blessings as the people of God are all the result of his victory. His victory. And we thought of the one that bore our burdens is the one that gives us his blessings. And here's, the, here's, the, here's these two and a half tribes, and they're being blessed, they're being blessed. And the blessing that they receive, this, this silver, these carrots that go, the carols, the, the brass, the iron, the raiment, it was all, it was all the spoils of victory. It was all the spoils of victory. And brothers and sisters, we are we are in the or we should be in the enjoyment of the blessings of the spoils of Christ's victory. Now we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. You know, so often people say to us, God bless you, God bless you. God, I mean, God bless me. God has blessed me. God has blessed me. God's blessed you. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, he's blessed you with every spiritual blessing. He's imparted it to us. Oftentimes the problem is not the fact that God hasn't blessed us, but the problem is the fact that we are not enjoying the blessing that he's given us. Which is the fruit of victory. The victory of the cross. And so often we don't go in for it. We don't enjoy it for ourselves. You know, sometimes we've got to enter into battles. Sometimes we've got to struggle through circumstances in order to appreciate the blessings that we have in the Lord. To make it our own personally. The children of Israel had to go in. They had to engage in the conflict. They had to endure the trial of the battlefield in order that that they may really enjoy what God had already promised them, what was already theirs. If someone had said, you know, oftentimes God has got to break us before he blesses us. Or before we enjoy the blessings that he gives us. And oftentimes God breaks us through the trials and difficulties and the strifes and the conflicts of life. You see, there's nothing lost in the life of a believer. Or there need be nothing lost. And all the trials we go through, the difficulties. They're all ordained of God, allowed of God. 
Because God wants to bring us to that point where we're cleaving onto him and we're just enjoying the blessings, the blessings that are ours in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that the blessings that, that they went back over Jordan with, that they had to share it with their brothers. You know, there were those who had remained in, on, on the other side of Jordan. The wives were there, and no doubt the servants were there, and there would be men there to look after the households. And, you know, Joshua says, uh, Joshua says, you've got to, you've, you've got to share them. Uh, share them with your brother. You know, they had fulfilled their promise. They had gone, they'd fought in the battle. They're now being demobbed, and they're going back with the spoil just to share with others, to share with others. As and sisters, we've said it before, you know, that really should be one of the one of the big things in our life. We should just be sharing, sharing with one another of what the Lord has done for us, what we're enjoying of the blessings of the Lord in our own life. Yeah, I was really pondering just the other day there. I was just reading one of the Psalms, Psalm 77, I think it was, and, and there the psalmist goes away back over the history of Israel. How many times do we read that history in the scriptures? I mean, I don't know how many, but it was, it's been on my mind and I'm going to try and get time this week to kind of work that out. But just think of the number of times that the Holy Spirit takes us back, takes us back to Egypt, takes us back to the Passover, takes us back to, 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 to the Red Sea, takes us back to the wilderness, takes us back to Jordan, takes us back and, and just gives us the history of God's dealings with his people just to remind them, just to remind them faithfulness of God and the power of God in their lives. The price that God paid to bring them right through to victory. Brothers and sisters, we need to, we need to share things. You know, that, that's, you know, David's sharing that with the nation again. And we need to share the victories that we enjoy. We need to share the spoils of that, the blessing we get from it. We need to share that with others. Verses 10 to 11, we've got the construction of a great altar. Uh, we read them when they came to the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. And the children of Israel heard say, behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. There was the building, there was construction of a great altar. You know, that word great, it's the idea of being impressive, something that was grand, something that was imposing, something that was conspicuously large, something that was large and highly visible uh, for miles around. It was a monument that was set up on the, the wilderness side of Jordan in the shape of the altar shape of an altar. And you know, that was really the cause of all the problem that we find in the rest of the chapter. It was this altar, this great altar that was built on the other side of Jordan. Of course, the altar was at Shiloh. You know, the brazen altar where the sacrifices had to be made uh, in the house of God, the place where God had placed his name. And, 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 and you know, that was where they, as, as we read in, in Deuteronomy and, 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 and other Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that there was only one place for the burnt offerings to be offered, and it was in the altar at the place where God placed his name, the place of God's choosing. And here's this altar, this great altar, being built on the other side of Jordan. And immediately there was an issue. And we read about it. It says in verse 11, the children of Israel heard, heard say. In verse 12, it says, and when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go to war against them. The reaction of the Israelites to this great war, the construction of the soil. You know, we notice it was, the reaction was based on their speaking. When they heard say, when they heard say, and they heard, and they jumped to a conclusion, and they get ready, ready for war. Are we an orphan so like that? Is that not just so like human nature? Hearsay. We hear a wee story, we hear a wee rumor, 
And we just take it as gospel truth. And we just form a judgment. And then we, then we form a strategy for dealing with it. Without asking any questions. The knives were out. And the swords were drawn. And there was a holy war. It was in pain then. You see the people in the well, the Canaan side of Jordan, you know, they thought, well, we, we've got truth on our side. Right? We've got truth on our side. We, we, we're, going to, we're, we're, we're doing the right thing. You know, God's commandments have been broken. These people are in the wrong and we're going to deal with it and we'll deal with it now and we're ready to deal with it. And they all gathered together. You know, there was a sense in which there was a principle that they had in mind that they wanted to defend. And, and we read about that in, in Deuteronomy chapter 13. And, uh, that, that when the children of Israel, because they thought that the, the two and a half tribes were going to sort of swing away to idolatry, swing away from the worship of the one true living God, the God of Jacob and Isaac and the God of, 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 of Moses. And, and they, were going to, they were going to be involved in idolatry. That was what they supposed. And you know, the Bible, the, the Lord instructed them if that was the case, if any of them was to lead them into idolatry, then they're to be dealt with. You know, the, 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 the whole thing was, was all cut and, cut and dried in their minds. But then, praise God, we read about the delegation that was sent by Joshua. It says in verse number 13, And the children of Israel sent to the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead. They sent Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priest, and with him ten princes of each chief, of each chief house, a prince, through all the tribes of Israel, and each one was a head of the house of the fathers among the thousands of Israel. A delegation that was sent. It's interesting, it was led by Phineas. You know, Phineas was a priestly man, but he wasn't a cowardly man. We read about him in, in Numbers chapter 25, and when there was sin, when sin rose, it said, raised its head, the sin of idolatry, he dealt with it. And he dealt with it pretty conclusively at the edge of a sword. And they send, they send Phineas, but they send this whole delegation of the heads of the fathers they sent to confront the Reubenites, the Gadites the half-tribe of Manasseh. Verses 15 to 18, we've got the accusation that was made against them. You know, it was good that they did send a delegation before they sent a battalion. You know, it really seemed that that was what was in mind of the children of Israel when they gathered at, 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 at Shiloh. They, they already had their, 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 their swords girded around their waist. They already had their armor on. They were ready to send a battalion into war. It was good that before the battalion was there, there was a delegation there. A delegation that would seek to sort things out. But think of the accusation in verse 15. And they came to the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the half tribe of Manasseh unto the land of Gilead. Gilead. And they spoke unto them saying, thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, what trespass is this? that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord and that you have built an altar that you may rebel this day against the Lord. And then he goes on to speak about the iniquity of Peel. That was the conclusion that jumped in. And that conclusion becomes an accusation. And the first thing they did, this delegation, albeit it was... They were acting on a divine principle. But they jumped to a conclusion. And they point the accusing fingers at these two and a half tribes. This is you, you are rebels. You rebels. You rebels. That was before they even established the fact. Before they asked any questions. 
Before they get round the table just to talk things through, they immediately come in with the accusing finger. Brothers and sisters, are we not so prone to that? And we just hear things and we jump to conclusions and we make accusations and we're just ready for a holy war. Rather than just sit down and say, like, let's talk this through. Let's really see where we're all at. They talked about their trespass. They talked about their turning away. They talked about their rebelling against the Lord. And they even say, listen, do you not remember? Do you not remember? You see, it's all the accusing finger. Before they even get a chance to explain themselves and accuse them of the iniquity of peer. You'll get that in, in Numbers chapter 23. I don't have time to go in there. It's the whole story of Balak and, and, and Balaam. And it's the sin of idolatry that's linked and mingled with the sin of immorality, as, as it so often is throughout Scripture. The danger of immorality, the danger of idolatry, dangers that are with us today, I think I suppose Paul really referenced uh, the, the sin of Peter in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, although he doesn't mention it by name. In verses 11 to 14, he talks about the things that happened to them, to the, 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 the uh, Israelites when 23,000 died in one day. And he goes on to, to, to talk about the, the, the temptation. It's a temptation that involved idolatry and, and, and involved immorality. That's what Corinth, that's what marked Corinth. It was a city that was marked by idolatry, and with that, it was immorality. And brothers and sisters, we're living in a world that is just the same an idolatrous world, an immoral world. Brothers and sisters, it's so easy to rebel against God by worshiping, bowing down, giving our lives, giving our time, giving our thoughts to the things of this. World, oh, that our hearts and minds are all would be centered and focused and surrendered to God. But I notice in verse 19 the suggestion that was made. It says, notwithstanding, so they make all these accusations, and they said, notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, if there's problems over there, then you pass over into the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwells, and take possession among us. But don't rebel against the Lord or against us in building an altar beside the altar of the Lord your God. There was a suggestion. There was an off-ramp. You will have heard that expression in our news these last few weeks in relation to the Ukraine uh, situation. And people have said, you know, we need to get put in an off-ramp. We need to get a get-out clause from it. There needs to be an opportunity for them to get out of this conflict. And I suppose that's really what, what, what uh, Phineas and this delegation are, are doing here in, in verse 19. They're saying, listen, here's, here's a way out. Here's, a, here's, a, here's an off-ramp. If, if, things are, if things are not suitable, if things are not conducive for you to live as the people of God on the, on the Gilead side of, 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 of Jordan, then just come over and join us. Come over and join us. And we'll accommodate you. I thought that was, I thought that was, was wisdom in that, wasn't it? You know, so often, you know, we accuse somebody and we, we back them into a corner and there's no way out. And we've got nothing to suggest. And we've got no helpful, no helpful input into the situation. It's just conflict. It's just that we're down on top of them. But, you know, here we, there's, a, there's grace here. And he says, well, you know, even if, if things are difficult, then, then just come, just come and join us. Just come and join us. We'll make room for you in the land of Canaan. You know, verse 20, we, we really read about the, what was in their mind, what was really in the mind of the, 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 uh, the ten and a half tribes. Uh, what was in their mind was, was, was the repercussions for themselves. <laughs> it says, did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing? And wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel, and that man perished not alone in his iniquity. You see, what they were really thinking about was the principle that one's behavior affects all. 
See, the, we, we are part of the, uh, we, we are the people of God and the two and a half tribes, the other people of God. If, if they are sinning against God, if they are pursuing idolatry, then, then God's wrath will come upon them and it will come upon us as well because, because one sins and we all sin. We're all affected. That was the sin of Achan, wasn't it? And the whole nation was prevented in its onward march through Canaan because of Achan's sin. And Achan's sin had to be judged before the whole, is, the whole of Israel when it was freed from it. And so that's really what they've got in mind, the repercussion. One person's sin, so the whole, the whole, it's the whole, the whole nation has been polluted by that. You know, that's a challenge, isn't it? And we've mentioned that before. Mentioned that way back in chapter 7 when we dealt with Achan. One sins. And the whole company is affected. And that's why we need all to, we need to search our hearts. And I know there's times in the prayer meeting when I think just a couple of weeks ago, Hanny mentioned that in prayer just to, to search our hearts. Is there anything? Is there any evil way in our lives? So something is hindering. So something's hindering. Hindering the blessing of God, hindering the, the movements of God, hindering the salvation of souls, hindering. Hindering a movement of God in our community. We need to examine our hearts. Because it could be a sin in my life. A sin in your life. The whole company doesn't need to be in sin. May just be one individual that is hindering the progress of the whole. Verses 21 to 24, we've got the explanation from the rebels, so-called rebels. You know, they said, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, they answered, they said to the heads of the thousands of Israel, the Lord God of gods, the Lord, the Lord God of gods, he knows and Israel, he shall know if it be in rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord. Save us not this day. We've built an altar. To, we haven't it built an altar to turn from following the Lord or to offer burnt offerings or meat offerings or peace offerings on it. The Lord, let the, if we've done that, then let the Lord himself require it. He says, but we have done it rather for fear of this thing, saying in time to come, your children might speak to our children, saying, what have, we, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? And so they give an explanation. An explanation says, listen, the Lord knows. The Lord knows. The Lord God of God knows. Twice they said that. You know, that's a lot better than saying, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I, I swear with my and my mother's grave or all that kind of stuff will be here for people over the years. I swear my mother's life or some of that. They said, listen, we, we, we're here before God and the Lord knows our hearts. The Lord knows our hearts. He does he know? He does know our hearts. He knows our motives. This was the problem here that the, 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 the tribes that had come across from uh, the Canaan side of, of, of Jordan, you know, they, they've come with their accusations, their condemnation. And all they could see was the, the actions. But they never knew the motive. And they never knew the explanation. You know, brothers and sisters, we can't, we can't, we can't judge people's motives. But the Lord can. And the Lord does. And they just come, they, they, these two and a half tribes, they just come before the delegation and they come before the Lord and they say, listen, there's not, there's not a single thought in their mind of rebellion against God. There's not a single thought about offering any kind of offering on this. He said, we're just conscious that we're kind of separate. There's a river between us and you. Maybe the time will come when our children will say, are you really part of the people of God? We just wanted to set up a memorial. We just wanted to raise a standard. We just wanted all our children to know that we are God's people just as much as the folks that have crossed Jordan and are living closer to Shiloh. He said, that's the motive. That's what it's all about. I just wanted to raise a testimony, 
to their family and to, their, and to, the, tra- and to the nations around. It was to preserve the spirituality of the tribes rather than to pollute them. Rather than to pollute them. You see, they were then a burden for their family. And I'm sure as we're all here this afternoon, we'll be a burden for our family. We need to raise a standard. We need to raise a standard of testimony as to who we are and whom we serve and why we serve him and what he's done for us. We need to keep on telling to our children and our children's children who our God is and what our God has done and what our God expects of us. We need to keep raising that standard. I fear, wasn't it, that our children would become like all of us? But they wanted to preserve them from idolatry. They wanted them to worship the one and only true God. Verses 26 to 29 was really the illustration of the altar. It was to be a witness. It was a replica to remind the people. Whatever the way, you know, and that's a good thing. Wherever we are and whatever circumstances we're in, may we never forget whose we are and re- reaffirm that truth to everyone. And it was verse 30 to 31 was the realization of the mistake. When they heard the explanation, the, this delegation, they accepted it, they were pleased, they were relieved. They, they said, We perceive that God is among us. God, is the God that preserved this disaster from taking place. If it had been left in Israel, and disaster, warfare would have, would have ensued, and, and, and blood would have been shed, and lives would have been taken. But you know, God preserved them. Then we see the acceptance of the reason by the people. And it says in verse number 32 to 34 that the children of Reuben, uh, it says that it pleased the children of Israel and the children of Israel bless God. And it says the children of Reuben, etc. They said, they called the Ed, <laughs> for it shall be a witness between us that the Lord God is God. So rather than seeking to deprive God and deny God of his rightful place. They said the purpose of this altar was really to give God his rightful place. The danger of jumping to their own conclusions. The danger of listening to hearsay and rumours and just making suppositions without seeing things through. Let's just pray.